At number 10, Hans George Newman. Newman was born the son of an intimacy worker and grew up in an urban orphanage in Kreuzberg, as well as in a foster family. On the 29th of December 1951, he was admitted to the Jugdenhof Schlachtensee by a juvenile judge for various thefts. In the discharge report, the boy was described a year later as calm and kind, open-minded, and in need of love. In 1953, his foster mother passed away. He found a connection in the family of a master craftsman, where he made an apprenticeship for precision mechanics. In 1956, he embarked for Canada but was deported to Germany in 1961 after being convicted of armed robbery. On the 13th of January 1962, he kidnapped a pair of lovers sitting in a parked car in Berlin and shot them after the woman had resisted being kidnapped. He was arrested six days later. The man had survived badly injured and was able to identify Newman but passed away shortly thereafter. Newman was sentenced to life imprisonment on the 30th of May 1963 for the double execution he committed. The trial attracted national attention. Newman has been the longest serving prisoner in Germany with more than 56 years in prison. At number 9, Larry Rains. On May 30th, 1964, Larry, posing as a hitchhiker, was given a lift by 30-year-old Gary Albert Smock, a Plymouth school teacher passing through Kalamazoo. During the trip, Rains brandished a weapon and forced Smock to leave the car and climb into the trunk, where he subsequently locked him in. While continuing the trip, Smock attempted to get out of the car after which Rain stopped the car, tied him up, and then shot him twice in the back of the head. He then stole three dollars and other items of material value before leaving the car on the side of the road, where it was discovered a few hours later by a police officer. Over the next few months, Rains told a number of acquaintances about the execution, due to which he was arrested in the early morning of June 5th, 1964, in front of his friend's house. He offered no resistance during his arrest and readily admitted to removing smock. With incriminating evidence, such as a watch and shoes, later being identified as belonging to Smock by relatives and friends. When he was taken to the police station, Rains told police that he had executed four others during holdups at various gas stations. He confessed to the May 30th execution of 33-year-old Charles E. Snyder in Elkhart, Indiana, the execution of an Air Force serviceman in Paw Paw, Michigan, the execution of a man in Las Vegas, Nevada, and another man in Kentucky. At number 8, Sirhan Bashara Sirhan. Around 12.15 a.m. on June 5th, 1968, Sirhan fired at United States Senator Robert F. Kennedy and the crowd surrounding him in the Ambassador Hotel in Los Angeles shortly after Kennedy had finished addressing supporters in the hotel's main ballroom. Authors George Plimpton, Jimmy Breslin, Pete Hamill, former professional football player Rosie Greer, and 1960 Olympic gold medalist Rafer Johnson were among several men who subdued and disarmed Sir Han after a struggle. Kennedy was shot three times, once in the head and twice in the back, with a fourth bullet passing through his jacket. He passed away almost 20 26 hours later at Good Samaritan Hospital. Five other people at the event were also shot, all of whom recovered. Paul Schrade, an official with the United Automobile Workers Union, William Weasel, an ABC TV unit manager, Ira Goldstein, a reporter with the Continental News Service, a friend of Pierre Salinger, one of Kennedy's campaign aides, and Erwin Stroll, a teenage Kennedy volunteer. During his trial, he asked for his legal team to withdraw and confessed to the crimes multiple times and asked to be executed. Due to this odd behavior, the judge denied all of these requests. Later, he was sentenced to deceasement, but was commuted to a life sentence in 1971. Sirhan requested requested parole on multiple occasions and was denied a total of 15 times. And number 7, Bobby Beausoleil. Robert Kenneth Beausoleil, born November 6, 1947, is an American executioner and associate of Charles Manson and members of his communal Manson family. He was convicted and sentenced to execution for the July 27, 1969 fatal stabbing of Gary Hinman, who had befriended him and other Manson associates. Beausoleil was later granted a commutation to a lesser sentence of life imprisonment, after the Supreme Court of California issued a ruling that invalidated all execution sentences issued in California prior to 1972. During his incarceration in the California state prison system, Beausoleil has recorded and released music. He has also worked on visual art, instrument design, and media technology. Although a parole board recommended him for parole in January 2019 in his 19th hearing for eligibility, the recommendation was denied by the governor of California. At number 6, Edmund Kemper. Edmund Emil Kemper III, born December 18, 1948, is an American executioner who sent a total of 10 people, including his own mother and her best friend, to an early grave from May 1972 to April 1973. Following his parole for executing his paternal grandparents, Kemper was nicknamed the Coed Executor, 
as most of his victims were female college students hitchhiking in the vicinity of Santa Cruz County, California. He stands at a height of 6 feet 9 inches. In North Fort California in August 1964, at the age of 15, he executed his grandparents. Following the executions, Kemper was briefly diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia by court psychiatrists and sentenced to the Atascadero State Hospital as a criminally insane juvenile. At number 5, Patrick McKay. David Groves, better known by his birth name, Patrick David McKay, born on the 25th of September 1952, is a British serial executioner who is believed to be one of the United Kingdom's most prolific serial executioners. He confessed to executing 13 people across London, Essex, and Kent in England between 1973 and 1975. After attracting his confessions to nine of the executions, he was convicted of three counts of manslaughter. Two additional cases were left to lie on file and police later found proof that he had executed one of these two victims. All of his confessions were found to match existing unsolved executions in and around London, and no one else has ever been arrested, charged, or convicted for these officially still unsolved crimes. In 2020, authorities launched fresh inquiries into his suspected executions, but they were unable to find sufficient evidence. Dartford MP Gareth Johnson has reportedly voiced his concerns over McKay's potential release. In July 2022, it was revealed that McKay's case had been referred to the parole board once again. He is believed to be currently imprisoned at HM Prison Lay Hill near Bristol in preparation for a possible release. At number 4, Leonard Peltier. Leonard Peltier, born September 12, 1944, is a Native American activist and militant member of the American Indian Movement, who, following a controversial trial, was convicted of two accounts of first-degree execution in the passing of two FBI agents in a June 26, 1975 shooting on the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation in South Dakota. He was sentenced to two consecutive terms of life imprisonment and has been in prison since 1977, currently 45 years and 6 months. Peltier was an active member of the American Indian Movement, an indigenous rights advocacy group that worked to combat the racism and police brutality experienced by American Indians. Peltier ran for President of the United States in 2004, winning the nomination of the Peace and Freedom Party and receiving 27,607 votes, limited to the ballot in California. He ran for Vice President of the United States in 2020 on a ticket with Gloria La Riva as the presidential candidate as well on tickets for other left parties and on the ballot of the Peace and Freedom Party. Peltier withdrew from these tickets on August 1st, 2020 for health reasons. At number three, Robert Maudsley in 1974, Maudsley garroted John Farrell in Wood Green, London. Maudsley surrendered himself to police, saying he needed psychiatric care. Maudsley was found unfit to stand trial and instead went to Broadmoor Hospital. In 1977, he and another resident, David Cheeseman, locked themselves in a cell with a third patient named David Francis. The attack was claimed to be in revenge for a homosexual attack on one of the friends of the two men. They tortured him to passing over a period of nine hours. After this incident, Maudsley was convicted of manslaughter and sent to Wakefield Prison. He disliked the transfer and made it clear that he wanted to return to Broadmoor. Maudsley was later sentenced to life imprisonment with a recommendation that he never be released. In 1978, Maudsley eliminated two fellow prisoners at Wakefield Prison in one day. He originally set out to eliminate seven. At number two, Ronald Allen Smith. Smith was sentenced to execution in March 1983 after he asked for the execution penalty after his conviction. Seven months earlier, he, along with an accomplice who were both under the influence of substances, executed two Native American men who offered them a ride while hitchhiking. They marched cousins Harvey Madman, 23, and Thomas Running Rabbit, 20, into the woods of the highway and shot them both in the head with a rifle. Smith refused a plea deal that would have seen him avoid deceased Roe, but spent his life in prison. He pleaded guilty three weeks later and then asked for, and was given, an execution sentence. Later, he changed his mind. Smith has had several previous execution dates, but each has been overturned. In November 2001, the United States Supreme Court denied a petition for review, and in 2010, the U.S. Supreme Court refused to hear his final appeal. The case was sent back to the state of Montana for another date of execution. At number one, David Carpenter. Carpenter's first attempted execution occurred in 1960, for which he spent seven years in prison. This was committed against Lois Rinna, the mother of future television personality Lisa Rinna. He was arrested for kidnapping in 1970 and spent another seven years behind bars. After his release, Carpenter became a suspect in the Zodiac executions, although he was eventually cleared. From 1979 to 1981, Carpenter executed five women in Santa Cruz County and Marin County. On May 10th, 1988, a San Diego jury convicted him on five counts of first-degree execution in the passings of Richard Stowers, Cynthia Moreland, Shauna May, Diane O'Connell, and Ann Elderson. Carpenter was sentenced to pass away in the gas chamber and remains on deceased row in San Quentin State Prison. Following his convictions for the Marin County executions, Carpenter was tried and subsequently convicted by a Santa Cruz jury for the executions of Ellen Hansen and Heather Skaggs. Carpenter is still a suspect in the executions of two other people. At number 10, 
Oleksandr Vitalyevich Yaromenko. The man, also known as ZL0M and Lamarez, is responsible for three main things according to the Secret Service. A. He hacked into the computer networks of MarketWired, PR Newswire, and BusinessWire. B. He stole confidential press releases containing material non-public information from the victim companies' internal computer networks prior to their public release. And C. He traded ahead of the material non-public information contained in the stolen releases before its distribution. The current reward on the man's head is $1 million for information leading to the arrest and or conviction of Radchenko and Yaromenko for participating in transnational organized crime. And number 9, Daniil Patekin. Daniil Patekin and Dmitry Vadimovich Karasavidi launched a sophisticated phishing campaign targeting users of multiple digital currency exchanges. Patekin and Karasavidi purchased and deployed multiple web domains that appeared to be websites belonging to legitimate digital currency exchanges. However, when users logged into these fraudulent websites, Patekin and Karasavidi were able to steal the user's credentials, enabling the defendants to control the actual digital currency exchange accounts, withdraw some or all of the victim's digital currency, and manipulate the market for digital currency. At number eight, another hacker, Roman Sergeyevich Kotov. Roman Kotov and other co-conspirators operated a prolific hacking organization that was responsible for several of the largest known data breaches. Among other exploits during that period, the defendants and their co-conspirators penetrated the secure computer network of several of the largest payment processing companies, retailers, and financial institutions in the world, and stole the personal identifying information of others. At number seven, Rashad Lamar Tulloch. On July 5th, 2018, a federal grand jury in Lexington, Kentucky returned a 24 count indictment, charging 15 foreign nationals with racketeering influenced and corrupt organizations act, RICO conspiracy, wire fraud conspiracy, money laundering conspiracy, and aggravated identity theft. The charges stemmed from the defendant's alleged roles in an international organized crime group based primarily in Alexandria, Romania, that defrauded American victims through online auction fraud, causing millions of dollars in losses. At number six, Fedor Rofovich Manikin. Manikin recruited and maintained a network of money mules, often visiting foreign students who opened bank accounts in their own names in the United States for the purpose of receiving laundered money and sending it to Russia. Manikin used his network of mule accounts to offer cash out services for illicit obtained funds from bank account takeovers, enabling the perpetrators to wire the illicit funds into the mule accounts. Mannequin notified the mules and their handlers of the timing and amounts of wire transfers of money from victim bank accounts into the mule bank accounts, directed them to make cash withdrawals from the mule bank accounts, and provided the dollar amounts, names, and locations of persons to whom the illicit funds should be sent. At number five, Ahmed Yassin Abdul Ghani. Amin Yassin Abdul Ghani managed the daily operations of Liberty Reserve between approximately 2006 and 2009. Liberty Reserve operated as a criminal bank payment processor designed to help users conduct illegal transactions anonymously and launder the proceeds of their crimes. It emerged as one of the principal money transfer agents used by cyber criminals and the world to distribute, store, and launder illicit proceeds. At number four, Mikhailo Sergeyevich Ridikov. Ridikov offered bulletproof hosting services, which is leasing servers from which law enforcement supposedly could not gain access or obtain information to his co-conspirators. Ridikov's bulletproof hosting services included frequently changing the locations of hacking platforms, erasing the contents of hacking platforms on short notice, accepting false credentials to register and lease hacking platforms, and discouraging internet service providers, ISPs, from deactivating hacking platforms suspected of illegal activity. As a result of this conduct, financial institutions, credit card companies, and consumers suffered hundreds of millions of US dollars in losses. At number three, Alexei Volodymyrovich Bistrov. Alexei Volodymyrovich Bistrov and his co-conspirators fraudulently obtained the online banking login credentials belonging to numerous customers of a US financial institution. Using those credentials without the knowledge or authorization of the rightful account holders, Bistrov and his associates set up ACH, automated clearing house links, between those victim accounts and destination accounts controlled by Bistrov and his associates. In doing so, Bistrov and his co-conspirators falsely represented themselves as the legitimate customers of the US financial institution, subsequently caused and attempted to cause said US financial institution to execute wire transfers into bank accounts controlled by Bistrov and his associates. Furthermore, Bistrov and his co-conspirators changed the verification phone numbers and verification email addresses on the victim accounts to phone numbers and email accounts under the control of the fraudsters. At number two, Egbe Tony Iyamu. Egbe Tony Iyamu is a member of the Cape Town, South Africa-based chapter of the Neo-Black Movement of Africa criminal organization, also known as Black Axe. 
From at least 2011 until 2021, Iyamu and other members of Black Axe worked together to engage in widespread internet fraud involving romance scams and advanced fee scams. The conspirators used social media websites, online dating websites, and voice over internet protocol phone numbers to find and talk with victims in the United States while using a number of aliases. At number one, the co-conspirator of her number 10 spot. Radchenko and Yaromenko's scheme focused on stealing annual, quarterly, and current reports of publicly traded companies before the reports were disseminated. Many of the stolen reports contained material non-public information concerning, among other things, the earnings of the companies. Radchenko and Yaromenko sought to profit illegally from the scheme by selling access to the non-public information contained in these yet-to-be disclosed reports and by trading the securities of the company before the investing public learned the same information. Number 10, Pascal Payet. Let's count up the things he's done to get himself into French prison. His original sentence was 30 years for an execution in 1997. Next, he got six years for a jailbreak in 2001, and then seven years for organizing a 2003 jailbreak, another five years for a jailbreak in 2000 Seven, and finally, 15 years for armed robberies and assaults on police while an escaped prisoner in 2007. All of those crimes give him a grand total of 63 years. By July 2007, Payette was one of the most closely surveyed prisoners in France and was never kept at the same prison for more than six months. He had been officially classified as a prisoner under especially high surveillance and placed in solitary confinement. Despite these measures, on July 14, 2007, taking advantage of Bastille Day celebrations, four masked men hijacked a helicopter from Cannes, Mandelieu Airport. They used it to free Payette from his solitary confinement in a prison in Grasse. Number 9. Alfred George Hines Hines was an amazing escape artist. He escaped from Nottingham Prison after sneaking through the locked doors and over a 20-foot prison wall, for which he became known in the press as Houdini Hines. He worked as a builder decorator in Ireland and throughout Europe until his arrest by detectives of Scotland Yard in 1956 after 248 days as a fugitive. After his arrest, Hines brought a lawsuit against authorities charging the prison commissioners with illegal arrest and used the incident as a means to plan his next escape by having a padlock smuggled into him while at the law courts. Two guards escorted him to the toilet, but when they removed his handcuffs, Hines bundled the men into the cubicle and snapped the padlock onto screw eyes that his accomplices had earlier fixed to the door. He escaped into the crowd on Fleet Street, but was captured at an airport five hours later. Hines would make his third escape from Kelmsford Prison less than a year later. He then returned to Ireland where he lived for two years as a used car dealer under the name William Herbert Bishop before his arrest after being stopped in an unregistered car. Number 8. Jack Shepard. Jack Shepard is perhaps the most celebrated criminal in England's history. He was originally arrested in 1724 after thieving and burglary. The man then went on to escape four times from prison, each time in an extravagant manner and being reported on heavily. Shepard was as known for his attempts to escape from prison as he was for his crimes. An autobiographical narrative, thought to have been ghostwritten by Daniel Defoe, was sold at his execution, quickly followed by popular plays. The characters of McKeith in John Gay's The Beggar's Opera in 1728 was based on Shepard, keeping him in the limelight for over a hundred years. He returned to the public consciousness around 1840 when William Harrison Ainsworth wrote a novel entitled Jack Shepard, with illustrations by George Cruikshank. The popularity of his tale and the fear that others would be drawn to emulate his behavior led the authorities to refuse to license any plays in London with Jack Shepard in the title for 40 years. Number 7. Frank Lee Morris Frank Morris was born in Washington, D.C. His parents abandoned him when he was 11, so he spent the rest of his childhood in foster homes, an orphan. He was convicted of his first criminal offense at 13, and by his late teens had been arrested for crimes ranging from narcotics possession to armed robbery. He spent most of his early years in jail serving lunch to prisoners. Later, he was arrested for grand larceny in Miami Beach, car theft, and armed robbery. Morris reportedly ranked in the top 2% of the general population in intelligence, as measured by IQ testing. He had an IQ of 133. He served time in Florida and Georgia, then escaped from the Louisiana State Penitentiary while serving 10 years for bank robbery. He was recaptured a year later while committing a burglary and sent to Alcatraz on January 20th, 1960 as inmate number AZ1441. He was a part of the infamous five-person crew who managed to escape Alcatraz. The crew used a raft made of raincoats and fake heads they'd sculpted during their time there to trick the guards. Number six, Richard Lee McNair. McNair was sent to prison for a robbery gone wrong, ending in the execution of a man and another man being shot four times. 
He has escaped multiple times from several prisons, but managed to dissuade police from sending him to a maximum security prison because it would be too far for his parents for them to visit. He then acquired a job at the prison fixing mailbag. After several months, McNair designed a way to leave the prison by hiding in a pallet of mailbags he'd fixed, and that was shrink wrap. He waited for a forklift to deliver him to a truck, which drove him an hour and 15 minutes away from the prison, where he cut himself out and began jogging off. Hours after his escape from Pollock, McNair was stopped by police officer Carl Bordelon. McNair had no identification and proceeded to give Officer Bordelon the alias of Robert Jones. When asked again five minutes later, he gave a different alias, Jimmy Jones, though the officer did not notice the different answer. McNair laughed and joked with the officer, and even as the officer got a matching description of the inmate, McNair appeared collected and calm. He successfully convinced Bordelon that he was jogging and in town to help on a post-Katrina roofing project, allowing him to go back to jogging within 10 minutes. Number five, Jay Jr. Sigler and his loyal family and friends. In his eighth year of a 20 year jail sentence, Jay Jr. Sigler, an inmate charged with armed robbery at the infamous Everglades Correctional Institution, decided to plan a prison escape strategy that saw him escape from prison with the help of his mother, Sandra Sigler, and a few of his friends. He escaped in broad daylight when three of his friends rammed an 18 wheeled truck through four prison fences, followed by a car driven by his mother. After escaping successfully, Jay and his friends swapped vehicles at a local mall. Jay was executed in an attempt to flee after realizing that they were being followed. The car he was driving slammed into an oncoming vehicle resulting in his passing. Number four, Antonio Ferrara. Ferrara, 35, who emigrated to France with his family in the 1980s, was in Fresnes prison in Val de Marne, having been jailed for bank robbery. He escaped when a gang set fire to cars in the local area to create a diversion, before raking the guard posts with automatic rifles and smashing down the door and interior walls with rocket launchers. They gave Ferrara explosives that allowed him to blow off the bars of his cell. He had previously arranged to commit a minor act of disobedience so as to be placed in a punishment wing, which was well located for the escape. It took three days of deliberations for the verdict to be pronounced at the Cour d'Assise de Paris after a 10 week trial. In total, 18 accomplices were sentenced, while two suspects were acquitted. Punishments ranged from suspended sentences to a variety of jail terms including 4 of 15 years each. The men were convicted of crimes including aiding and abetting escape, destroying goods with explosives, burning cars, and transporting weapons. Number 3. Stephen J. Russell Stephen J. Russell is an American con artist, known for escaping from prison multiple times. On March 20th, 1998, Russell posed as a millionaire from Virginia in an attempt to legitimize a $75,000 loan from Nations Bank in Dallas. When bank officials became suspicious and alerted the police, Russell feigned a heart attack and was transported to the hospital. Russell was placed on security watch, but he impersonated an FBI agent and called the hospital on his cell phone to tell them he could be released. US Marshals later tracked down Russell in Florida, where they arrested him on April 5th, 1998, when he went to retrieve the facts. Russell was sentenced to a total of 144 years in prison, 99 years for the escapes, and 45 years for subsequent scams. Number two, Jason Barnum. The eyeball man, Jason Barnum, was sentenced to 22 years in prison for shooting an Alaska police officer. Barnum's offenses were driven by a serious substance addiction, reports The Independent. What made him even more dangerous and intimidating was his tattoo-filled visage. Barnum had one of his eyeballs completely tattooed. The shooting happened when police were investigating home burglaries and car thefts. Officers were inspecting a hotel in 2012 when Barnum opened fire from a bathroom. Two officers shot back, striking Barnum in the arm, and one officer was injured. Barnum later admitted to committing thefts and burglaries to feed a substance addiction. Number one, Thomas Silverstein. Thomas Edward Silverstein was an American criminal who spent the last 42 years of his life in prison after being convicted of four separate executions while imprisoned for armed robbery, one of which was overturned. Silverstein spent the last 36 years of his life in solitary confinement for executing corrections officer Merle Klutz at the Marion Penitentiary in Illinois. Prison authorities described him as a brutal executioner and a former leader of the Aryan Brotherhood prison gang. Silverstein maintained that the dehumanizing conditions inside the prison system contributed to the three executions he committed. He was held in a specially designed cell in what is called Range 13 at ADX Florence Federal Penitentiary in Colorado. He was the longest held prisoner in solitary confinement within the Bureau of Prisons at the time of his passing. Many prison guards refused to talk to Silverstein out of respect for Klutz. Thanks for watching, like the video and leave a comment if you found this video interesting, and we'll see you next time.